Hello everyone, Scott Luthold here with 4 Expedition. Welcome back to another episode on our YouTube and Facebook channels. I'm really excited to be out here today. It's been uh, about a month since I recorded and created any kind of a video to post for you. And that's mainly because of logistics around a move that I made both in my personal life and with my businesses. And now that I've gotten that all settled down, uh, I'm ready to get back to providing some really nice experiences out here in the wilderness. Today I'm sitting in, on the north slope of the San Francisco Peaks north of Flagstaff, Arizona. And as you can see behind me, the San Francisco Peaks here have just had a beautiful blanket of fresh snow. Yet, down here in the prairie area, it's about 68 to 70 degrees. It's a gorgeous sunny day, there's not a cloud in the sky. And this evening I expect it to get down to about 35 to 40 degrees. I'm up here for a two-day excursion. Tonight I'll be camping in my rooftop tent here in the Ponderosa Pine Forest, which by the way is the largest stand of Ponderosa Pine in the world. And then um, tomorrow I'll be getting up and I've got a backpack completely packed and my dog and I are going to be heading into the wilderness here in the Ponderosa Pine Forest to have an awesome overnight camping excursion in a remote country yurt that um, is on the Coconino National Forest property. There are actually several yurts that you can rent and the one I'm renting is called the Honeysuckle. Uh, there's another one called Lupine and um, I forget what the other ones are called but uh, anyhow you can generally um, rent them and they're available provided by the Arizona Nordic Center and basically you hike on the cross-country ski trails back to the yurts. They do provide firewood they provide a wood-burning stove. Um, there is a porta potty generally about 100 yards away from each yurt. There's also a picnic table and a fire pit, as well as an outdoor grill. Uh, there are fire restrictions uh, from time to time in the Coconino National Forest. There happens to be a fire restriction right now. Hang on a second. <laughs> My dog's rolling around in the grass here, and there happens to be some loose barbed wire on the ground and she's rolling around in the grass and she's about ready to roll into the barbed wire so I had to put a stop to that. Um, we're not going very far back. My, my dog, as many of you know, is 14 years old. Um, she's been pretty spry lately but she can probably only get about a mile or two under her belt so we're going to keep it a little bit short but I'm going out there alone. My hope is that I'm going to be able to have a little bit of a Henry David Thoreau experience like he had on Walden Pond for a night. Do some reading, swinging in a hammock, do a little bit of writing, day hiking to some of the beautiful views that I'm sure that they have on that property of the mountain range here. Anyhow, um, I'm really excited to share this with you. Sit back in your armchair and, and uh, enjoy the ride. Thanks much. So here we are at camp, found a really nice spot that was an unmarked uh, jeep trail that kind of meandered up the slope toward the mountain. Just got a really nice view of the mountains right here. Very secluded, nice little meadow over here. Um, driving up in here we saw a deer and uh, of course the dog was pretty alert. Alright, so uh, I thought maybe I'd take a few minutes to show you my ultralight backpacking food. Now I'm not really ultralight backpacking tomorrow. I did bring my heavier um, backpack, <clears throat> mostly because I've got a lot of dog items to bring, her bed, her jacket, her bowls, her food, 
and uh, of course I have some filming equipment and so forth also. So for the most part though, I've got mostly um, the kind of food that I generally bring when I'm ultralight backpacking. So I don't generally like to eat dehydrated prepackaged foods that you can get at the outdoor stores. I just don't think it tastes very good. It's not very high quality. So I've put together my own menu. I've got a list of food items that I keep in my notes in my iPhone. And as I said, um, generally speaking, I like to ultra light backpack. And my entire backpack, including hunger and food, is generally no more than 30 pounds. That includes tent, sleeping bag, water, everything. So one item I like to bring is some sort of a cabbage salad. And the reason I like to bring cabbage salad is because generally it stays fresh and firm for the entire length of my backpack trip. So if I went on a five day backpack trip, some kind of cabbage salad is really nice to bring. Um, I like to make red cabbage salad myself by chopping it up and putting carrots in there. Uh, sometimes I'll squeeze a little bit of lemon in there. Um, add a few other vegetable items that you can expect that will stay pretty firm over the course of an entire backpack trip. I also like to bring powdered mashed potatoes. I'll usually mix that with something like this, this tortilla soup, uh, which has black beans, um, corn, and all sorts of other really nice seasonings and so forth. I'll, I'll boil that up and then I'll make roasted garlic potatoes and I'll mix that together and that's a really nice meal. You can also put bacon bits and things like that in there. Um, a lot of times I like to bring uh, a, a packaged chicken and I didn't bring one this time because I couldn't find it so I actually bought some shredded chicken from Whole Foods that I'm going to eat tonight uh, while I'm car camping. But usually I can get a pre-packaged chicken that comes in a package sort of like one of these and um, I'll usually mix it with either this Bombay Tasty Bites Bombay potatoes which has a really nice Indian seasoning or even uh, lentils um, and maybe I'll even mix in some tandoori rice. That makes a really nice meal. And I uh, put that together with the chopped salad and you're pretty much good to go. I'm a meat eater. I generally don't like to eat a lot of red meat. I usually eat chicken and fish. However, uh, when you're backpacking, a salami is actually a really, really nice thing to bring. A salami stays very firm through your entire trip. And in fact, if you don't open it, it stays perfectly fine and you can bump it all over the place and nothing's going to happen to it. It's pretty indestructible. But once you open it, um, you just slice off pieces of it and, and eat that along your trip. And um, you can expect that it'll stay perfectly fine for the duration of your backpack trip. For lunches, I like to eat um, albacore tuna. Sometimes I'll eat these things called thinners. They're a thin little bagel or a thin bun of some kind. For breakfast, um, I like to eat oatmeal on my backpack trips. I've showed you that before. I also like to bring some beef jerky along for an extra snack. But for breakfast, organic gluten-free oatmeal. I'll usually mix in some freeze-dried strawberries and I'll heat up some coconut milk powder. This is dairy-free, gluten-free. It's really fantastic for in your coffee and anything that you might want to add milk to. And it stays good for a very long time. So I'll boil some of that up I'll mix that in with my gluten-free organic oatmeal, and I'll put some strawberries in there. I also, for a snack, like to bring trail mix. Um, this one is a peanut and M&M one, which, of course, is a little bit of a splurge for me. Uh, I bring some organic apples, and then I really enjoy these Nugo dark chocolate pretzel and sea salt organic and gluten-free vegan chocolate bars. And then uh, your trusty Lara bar. I really like the cherry pie flavored. And then for extra energy, I usually bring some vitamin C powder. I'll also bring some Cliff Shot. This is really good. It's espresso. Uh, Cliff Shot energy. And then for coffee or morning, I'll usually take. I'll usually buy some of these things. These are instant coffee. They're organic, they're not Folgers crystals or something like that, they're actually really good. And then um, if I don't have coffee, I'll maybe have some Irish breakfast tea. And then I've got some stevia powder in here. And pretty much, oh, and then a couple other things, you've seen this before, this is chia seeds. I'll put some chia seeds in my breakfast and sometimes I'll also have turmeric 
uh, tea for breakfast, which I've showed you that before as well. And then, uh, of course, along with my breakfast, oftentimes I like to bring these protein superfood powder mixes. These are really great. Uh, I can mix those in with my breakfast, actually, or I can just... Um, heat up some water and stir it in and it's just a nice little addition to give me a little extra oomph in the morning. So um, that usually suffices in giving me a little extra energy until lunchtime. Alright so there you have it. That's pretty much what I like to bring on my ultralight backpacking trips for food. If you have any questions just make a comment. I'll try to respond as quickly as possible and as detailed as I possibly can. If you have any questions just let me know. Tasty. You know, I'd like to add one more tidbit about these Bombay potatoes. They're really not meant for anything other than solo travel. You don't want to eat these when you're traveling with other people, and especially if you're sharing a tent with other people. And I probably don't have to tell you why, but these things are very spicy. So only the dog and I will have to deal with the aftermath. So take that into consideration when you're planning your backpacking food list. It's almost pitch black out. You probably can't see much. There's a silhouette of all the trees. The stars are shining. There's not a soul out here. It's so incredibly peaceful, amazingly still. I'm out here alone, it's just me and the trees. I'm talking with God. When you're out in the wilderness alone, standing among the trees, with nothing but the auburn glow of the setting sun and the stars, you can't help but feel a connection to all things. If you've never been out, on your own, in the wilderness, sitting alone in the dark is an experience definitely to be had. Get out there and do it now. Come in with the trees, sing songs with the stars, have a conversation with God, venture out. You know, in about two weeks, I guess maybe about two weeks' time, Flagstaff, Arizona will be overrun with Unimogs and Earth Roamers, world travelers um, attending Overland Expo. And uh, I've mentioned in the past I've attended Overland Expo since about 2009. And uh, I mentioned also that I've 
actually been a guest speaker. And last year I went to Expo, I walked around a little bit through the campground, and I discovered just how many people have come to enjoy going to Expo. But the trouble I have is that uh, people are up there, they're camping literally right next to each other. It's, it's, they're just packed in there like lemmings. And that's just not really my thing. I know people really want to feel like they're a part of something. That's not really me. I do feel like um, I enjoy being a part of the Overland community, but I'm not really one to go on a rally or participate in, an, uh, in a backcountry excursion with, you know, 150 other vehicles like, um, you know, other organizations like Overland Bound tends to do. And that's okay, uh, people doing that. Um, I do have a little bit of trouble with it having to do with the impact that it probably has on the land. Also, I'm not really that interested in sucking up that much exhaust, basically breathing in 150 cars worth of dust. So generally I tend to travel alone or with one other vehicle, and then generally if I go with one other vehicle or maybe two other vehicles, we separate and spread ourselves way out so we're not dealing with the dust and the exhaust and all of that. And when we do get to where we're going camping, we are pretty low impact. I had a gentleman email me recently after visiting my website and reading a couple of articles on there and he was asking about what it is I spoke on at Expo, talking about creating a life map for yourself and then determining from that life map what your personal information assets are, the things you know that uh, you could leverage online to make money. As we progress through the summer you're going to see some pretty significant changes going on in my life in order to set myself on a course toward really working more with 4Expedition and having the freedom and flexibility to do that. It's more, it's, it's a passion of mine and uh, I really want to pursue that passion. And I know a lot of you out there have passions and you're trying to figure out exactly how you can position yourself to be able to invest more time in those, in those endeavors and I could probably help you with that, so stay tuned and I'll share more information on that soon. All right, you ready to do some backpacking? Here we are at the Arizona Nordic Center. These are the front country yurts. So there's the lodge over there, um, that building back there. This is a front country yurt. They've also got uh, cabins here. Looks like there's a little snow still on the ground. You can come up here and just park your car, rent one of these really cute little cabins. There's picnic tables, got grills. And then uh, here are some smaller front country yurts so again you can park your car right next to these and stay in a yurt for the night or for the weekend and literally it just looks out to open forest here there's nothing between these yurts and the san francisco peaks other than maybe one or two forest roads All right, so here's the trail map. And uh, we are right here at the lodge, and we're going here to the Honeysuckle. It's not a very long hike. Um, basically, it's uh, probably a little about a mile and a half, really, uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a pretty much the distance my dog could probably go. I did have this one reserved, but I canceled that reservation. This one's called the Lupine. And then the furthest one away is up there at the top, and that's called Morning Glory. And that one's probably three miles, maybe, from the, from the lodge. There are some larger yurts here as well that sleep more people. I'm, the one I'm renting is only like a 12 by 12 and sleeps two people. So I have these trekking poles. These are by Black Diamond. 
the titanium. Super strong, super lightweight. They come apart and fold up into a pretty small bag. When I don't really want to use them backpacking, I can keep them in my bag and they don't really take up much weight. However, it is said that using trekking poles in your backpacking actually reduces the strain on your knees by something like 30%. I'll verify that and put uh, a note at the bottom of this video, but I mean 30% if that's the truth. That's a significant savings on both your knees and your hips and your ankles. I always wear tall hiking boots, <clears throat> mainly because I've twisted my ankle, ankle too many times backpacking or trail running. I just don't want to risk that. But we're up pretty high in elevation. It's pretty warm out actually. And I've got this sweatshirt on, which is probably more than I'd like to have on right now, but it's only a mile hike to the yurt. I was the only car in the parking lot, so I'm going to assume that no one else is actually staying in any of the yurts today. So I may actually be up here by myself, which is pretty cool. So all along the trail here, I've been noticing elk hoof prints. This is a pretty busy thoroughfare, I'm sure, for all sorts of wildlife. Here's another one up here. Yeah. I was mountain biking in the San Francisco Peaks one time. I went up to the top of Mount Eldon, and uh, they've got like a, there's like a 12 mile single track downhill from the top of Mount Eldon all the way through Schultz Pass and down to the bottom of the mountain. But I was hauling ass through there with a friend of mine named Craig from college and uh, I was ahead of him we were probably dropping on this single track going about 30 miles an hour he came into a clearing and there was a black bear standing right next to the trail and I just just flew right past it and I yelled bear and my friend my friend Craig basically had to deal with this bear being there and alert that we uh, that we were coming through but he just zipped right past it as well, and we just kept going. But uh, the San Francisco Peaks have a lot of different wildlife. There's Last time I camped up here at the Honeysuckle Yurt, there were coyotes howling all night long. You know, there's black bear, there's elk, there's mule deer, uh, hawks, eagles, all sorts of kaibab squirrels. Kaibab squirrels are pretty cool. They've got long pointy ears with uh, long hair sticking off the ends of their pointy ears. If I see one, I'll point it out to you for those of you who don't live in Arizona. But uh, we're taking a break because my 91-year-old dog needs it. And um, it's kind of a slow pace for the two of us here. I've got this pack on. And uh, as I told you before, I do a lot of ultralight backpacking. But this pack is not ultralight. Um, I probably got upwards of 60 pounds worth of stuff in here. And that's mostly because, uh, I've mentioned before, I've got a lot of the dog stuff. I've got a lot of filming equipment to be able to capture the yurt uh, experience. And uh, later on in June and July, I'll be getting new equipment um, and really go towards something that's much more lightweight, easier to handle and better sound quality, all of that. So just decided I wanted to get all of my ducks in order with my move and, and my bill situation and all that before I went out and start buying equipment for uh, making quality films. I don't know, the stuff I've been making so far has been pretty decent, so as long as I'm happy with it, and you are all at least somewhat happy with it, then uh, you know, then I think we're good to go, but anyhow. All right, well, we're about halfway to the yurt. We're gonna just uh, press on here. All right, looks like we're coming up on the yurt. Not a moment too soon. Pups a dragon. So here we are. So we've been hiking on a cross-country ski trail and you can rent these yurts both in the summer and in the winter. I really tried to get up here this winter and cross-country ski to one of these yurts. But the weekend that I booked, there was no snow, so that's that. Anyhow, here's our yurt, honeysuckle. This is a, 
shed full of firewood that you can usually use, but because there's fire restrictions. There's a grill. There's an axe to chop wood. And there's a dog that's really tired. Oh, yeah. Well, that isn't anything less than heavenly. Taking off that bad boy. So what's cool is that these yurts, um, it's self-check-in, so I've got a code that I'm gonna put in here to get into my yurt. This is, oh, it's actually unlocked, nice. All right, so here we are inside. Nice skylight that you can see the stars at night. There's a table in the corner with a lantern, two chairs, two really nice thick sleeping mats. They've got these uh, plastic bins to put your food in to keep the rodents and stuff away. There's some hooks here to hang some clothing. This is to hang yourself if you're unhappy. Actually, no, that's to hang a that's to hang the lantern. There's a fire extinguisher. There's some rules, and then uh, here's the awesome wood burning stove which unfortunately I will not be able to use because of the fire restrictions. And uh, one thing about this that um, is kind of a bummer is that if uh, the wood-burning stove was going and it was cool enough in the morning, I'd just cook my food on top of it. But I did bring a, a backpacking stove. So yeah, that's it. Here we are, I'm gonna open up the blinds on the windows here on the east side to let the sunlight outside light in. I'm not going to open up the blinds on the west side because I don't want it to get hot in here. These yurts can actually get pretty toasty. So. Got some books along. So believe it or not, you're gonna probably laugh at this, but I'm still reading this book, Voluntary Simplicity. But uh, that's because I stopped reading it and I started reading another book called Conscious Loving. And um, I thought I'd bring this along, maybe I could finish it up. I also have this really nice journal that I got from Subaru. That I write some nice things in. I got some um, affirmations here. This is uh, a gentleman named Paramahansa Yogananda who started the Self-Realization Fellowship. He's from India. Settled in Encinitas, California. It's a really nice little book. And believe, believe me, uh, this is a quality book. It's called Cosmic Chance. And again, this is from the Self-Realization Fellowship. I go there every once in a while. And uh, it's a really nice book full of chants you can repeat over and over for good, uh, good vibes. Gonna have a little bit of lunch. And then um, probably set up a hammock out here in the shady trees. Read some books. And uh, otherwise just... Take it easy for the rest of the day. So as I mentioned, we got these bins here. And these bins are great because they're designed to keep your food out of the hands, or I should say out of the paws, of rodents. It keeps them out of, your, out of your stuff. So first thing you want to do when you get to this uh, yurt is just take all your food and stick it down in there. I got lots of it, because I'm a hungry boy. Bam, bam. Oh, it's still coming. Still coming. Whew. That's not an ultralight pack right there. Oh, now I gotta have dog food. 
There we go. That should be pretty much everything. Yep. So, I'll actually have some of this trail mix. Pull out some beef jerky. This is sweet jalapeno. Yummy, yummy. Eat one of these bars. Probably tear through some of this tuna. Maybe have a Lara bar. I got an apple in here too, but I'll probably save that for tomorrow morning. Actually, apples up here. There we go. Good sized meal. See? Boom, boom. So I don't really bring a mug, but inside my titanium pot here, I showed you this before, I think when I was paddle boarding on Bartlett Lake, but uh, this is a Vargo titanium pot, really nice pot. But inside here I've got some fuel, got a couple lighters, and then I've got these, this bowl set that if you take this apart, inside you got a regular bowl, and then you got another bowl, but it's got an insulator on the outside. So if you're drinking coffee or something, you have that insulator to keep your hands from burning. You put this lid on it, it's got a little hole here to let the air in, little mouthpiece. You can just kind of take a drink like that. So as you might suspect, people that come and stay here put their information in a, a little guest book. And you've got maybe eight or ten people commenting in here. Here's somebody from Atlanta. Somebody came for their anniversary. Guy brought his girlfriend up. Oh yeah. Looks like some pretty decent folks. Usually anybody that's gonna rent and hike back to a backcountry yurt. Probably somebody who likes being off grid. People who like being off grid are generally uh, pretty, pretty respectful of nature and and the wilderness and so on. So, just like me, maybe just like you. Um, but uh, you gotta you gotta consider this little this little spot. It's a really nice one, and there's some awesome hiking that you can do throughout the rest of the Nordic Center. Super spicy. I'll give you a tiny piece. That's it. You know, I wasn't always a writer. In high school, I actually didn't do very well in English. Of course, I really didn't do all that well in a lot of studies. I really wasn't all that focused on academics at the time. Mostly I was just interested in girls. Downhill skiing, mountain biking, partying with my friends on the sandbars of the Mississippi River, things like that. I remember one time in high school I wrote a piece about uh, my experience while sitting in a ski lodge. And that was probably the f my favorite piece that I ever wrote at that age. It's probably one of the only pieces I ever wrote at that age. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it wasn't until later on in life that I started to do a lot of writing and discovered that I'm actually really good at it. 
hence the publishing of my first book and uh, the subsequent books that I'm writing now. I also took up nature photography and discovered I was very good at that as well. So I'm working on a book that ties the two together. But journaling with a pencil on paper is something that not a lot of people do anymore. I actually own and run a social network called True Journal. And um, that's a digital journal system. And there's probably about a thousand members on there. And I journaled on there for quite some time and kind of got away from it. I just don't feel like sitting in front of a computer is the ideal way to journal. The ideal way to journal is to sit down with a, a booklet like this and spend some time out in nature and do some writing. It's just not something I spend a lot of time doing or haven't spent a lot of time doing. I think it's something I probably start to do a little bit more. Sharing thoughts in video it seems to be fairly appropriate for the amount of energy I want to invest. I feel like my life is moving in a direction toward this voluntary simplicity concept it is life in its vastness, subtlety, and preciousness that the context within which simpler living acquires its most compelling meaning and significance. To break through the superficiality of the consumerist existence and deepen our appreciation of life, we can remember that it is the universe that is our home. Thought I'd take a minute to read some of these entries that people put in here. I thought this was pretty cute. We came here February 3rd for our fourth anniversary. My boyfriend was aloof on the car ride up. While we were hiking through the forest, he was asking me pointed questions about our relationship. He insisted that we exchange anniversary cards at the golden hour. When I opened his card, it had an arrow pointing up. I looked up and he was holding a ring and asked me to marry him. We spent the rest of our night eating and playing board games, enjoying the moment while the moment was still ours. Nice. Way to go, Brett Park. That's how you do it. Here's another one. The yurt was awesome. Be careful trying to throw knives into trees. Yeah. One bounced back and stuck in my leg. It's going to be a really fun hike out. <laughs> I can tell you, don't play those kinds of games when you're out in the wilderness when you know you have to hike out. About two years ago, I was backpacking in Fossil Creek Canyon, which is here in Arizona. It's a beautiful spot. It was before they had a permit system. And I uh, camped overnight and got up the next morning, was going to do a little hike down to a waterfall. And I uh, hiked past this guy's camp, and he had two pit bulls off-leash. And those mothers came running right at me and bit me right in the groin. And we were four and a half miles straight down into the bottom of a canyon. So I rushed back to my tent, and uh, my partner who was with me, she had to sew me up. Well, she didn't sew me up. She patched me up. I was gushing blood out of my scrotum. Yep. No, no joke. And uh, we had to hike four and a half miles out of the canyon with our backpacks on and rush to an emergency room. Now, now that's a mishap that, um, you know, could, I guess, in, in a way, be considered something you can't control. You know, I don't know if I would have had a gun or something on me. Maybe I'd have, maybe I'd have shot the dogs before it bit me or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, you know, if you're out here in the wilderness and you're throwing knives, well, you know, that's certainly a mishap that can be avoided. So whoever wrote that didn't put their name on here, and that's probably why. So it's my turn to write something in here. I'll tell everybody how I invited the entire YouTube community with me. It was like trying to fit everybody into a phone booth. Cabbage salad looks pretty good, huh? 
hasn't been refrigerated since yesterday morning yesterday morning and still perfectly fine this looks really good it smells fantastic this kinetic ultra titanium stove that I've got really is an amazing little stove it's super lightweight comes with a flint get it started and uh, it really it really does the trick probably cut up some of the salami and put it right in that soup to give me a little more protein all right so there you have it I'm not even gonna dirty another bowl I'm just gonna eat right out of this pot Ooh, that's good I've never had this before saw it on the shelf at Sprouts so I thought I'd grab it to mix with mashed potatoes but I'm not that hungry this soup with a little salami together really does the trick so there's an elk just down the road I'm afraid I'm gonna scare it away but I want to hopefully see it out there there's a meadow down the road here a little ways Pretty good size elk. See, oh, there's two of them. Oh, shit. I see them out there. They're in the forest. But unfortunately, I think I made too much noise. I was looking at this axe over here. This one right here. The one I was using earlier today. And I was thinking to myself, hmm. Doesn't seem right leaving this axe outside my yurt all night long. It just seems like seems like a horror film waiting to happen. So I think I'm gonna bring it in with me tonight. Good call. So over there's the porta potty. I was thinking if you ever come out here by yourself, do a little solo camp. I would highly recommend that if you think that you got to do a number two sometime after dark that you consider getting it done before the sun goes down because when you got to come out of the yurt with your headlamp on walk all the way over here to this porta potty sit down and do your business it can be a little bit unnerving to say the least to be sitting on the pot out here in the middle of nowhere inside of a porta potty and again it's uh, probably another another horror film waiting to happen so it's number 884 good number good as any pretty clean inside here full rack of TP they even give you some hand sanitizer. That way the axe murderer can wipe his hands after he covers them with your blood. <laughs> Come on, Shay. Well, today is Cinco de Mayo. Tomorrow's May 6th. Um, but more importantly, May 5th and 6th of this year in my life, has more to do with the Mankind Project New Warrior training going on this weekend in Prescott, Arizona. I'm a member of Mankind Project. I'm a new warrior. I've gone through the new warrior training. And I really honor and respect any man who is brave enough to go through it and become much more conscious and awake in their lives. And uh, we have a tradition in uh, MKP where we do a sage burning ceremony. And we like to do a, um, a sage cleansing up and down our bodies. Cleanse away all the bad energies or any adversity going on in our lives. And we honor the energy and the spirits of the north, of the south, of the east and the west. We also honor the energies of Mother Earth and of the sky and within our ancestors and um, tonight I'll honor my father who passed away at age 56 of a brain aneurysm 
I have a picture of them here in my book that I um, was looking at earlier today. It reminded me of him, so I honor my father. And I, um, I honor all the men going through MKP New Warrior training this weekend and anytime um, in the near future, anywhere else in the world. Aho. Good morning, everyone. Had a really good night's sleep last night. Didn't really dip down too cold, so uh, in fact, I was able to come outside in just a t-shirt last night, and it wasn't too bad. Got up this morning, made myself some coffee with some powdered coconut milk, uh, a protein, bowl of protein, basically, and then I mixed in the rest of my dehydrated strawberries. And then I've got this apple here I'm going to eat. I think we're going to pack up. It's only about 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to pack up and head back to my car and then head home uh, so I can start editing this video and get it out there to you all. All right, so wrap things up here and we'll see you down at the bottom of the hill. Want to go? Want to go bye bye Yeah, let's do it, you cutie. <laughs> all right, here we go. Come on, Shay Shay. For those of you not in the USA that are watching this video, you'll notice, notice that there's markings on all the trees. There's a whole bunch of them right here. The reason for that is we're in national forest land, so the Arizona Nordic Village is maintained, I think it's maintained by the Forest Service, or it's private, and it's on Forest Service land. But the reason for these markings is that these are all tagged by the Forest Service to eventually be thinned out. Flagstaff, uh, Northern Arizona University actually has um, one of the best forestry departments in uh in the united states and students come here from all over the country to learn how how to properly maintain a forest keep it healthy and so the ponderosa pine forests around here are all really well maintained and thinned out these trees obviously just haven't been cut at this point i have a friend named neil that runs the nature conservancy facility here in Flagstaff, it's called Heart Prairie, and um, one of these days I'll probably get up there and film an episode and interview him and talk to him about how he maintains forest and a healthy prairie, restoring healthy prairie and so forth. It's a beautiful morning out, not cold at all. I mean, it shouldn't be cold, it's early May, but as I pointed out yesterday, there's fresh snowfall on the San Francisco peaks, and there's still a little bit of snow on the ground, as I showed you also yesterday, in certain spots. All right, I spotted the car, heading back to the village, and it doesn't look like anybody's here even today. They do maintain the yurts, so I imagine at some point today somebody will go out and check and make sure that the yurt that I stayed in <clears throat> was left clean and all of that. But for the most part, I got here yesterday, there wasn't a single car here. 
and I'm arriving back and there's not a single car here. So that means that I had this entire village and all of the Babbitt ranch land that this sits on, Coconino National Forest, completely to myself. So if you really want to get out into the wilderness and have some solitude, I imagine uh, as we, we get further into the summer, more people will be will be uh, reserving the yurts. But this time of the year, May, it's still uh, questionable whether there could be snow or it could be cold or if there's a fire restriction. Usually there are fire restrictions end in July or so because we have a we have a monsoon season, and once the rains start coming, there's no more need for a fire restriction. But then, of course, you run the risk of having to hike back in the rain or something like that, which isn't that big of a deal, but it can be for some people. There's that beautiful machine. I think that's a wrap. We're back at the uh, village and uh, cars all loaded up. Gonna head down to uh, home and uh, get this thing put together for you and get it uploaded and give you something to enjoy later this week. All right, have a good one and look forward to uh, talking with you again in our next video. Take care.